Fine furniture, musical instruments, functional art, beautiful decoration. These pieces, and others like them, are crafted in wood by master woodworkers who live here in Santa Cruz County and on the Central Coast. In this series, we meet some of these craftsmen and explore the paths they took to develop their talents. We will look at examples of their work. We'll discover what and who inspired them. Please join us as we enter their workshops and watch them demonstrate the skills and the techniques they use in creating their signature pieces. Hello and welcome back to Woodworks Roundtable, part two of our programme on joinery techniques. My name is John Hall and I'm pleased to welcome back Mickey Singer, Ron Day and Roger Heitzman of the Santa Cruz Woodworkers to continue the discussion that we started in our last programme on common methods of joinery, how to construct them and how and when to use them in woodworking projects. In part one, we talked about how to strengthen joints using dowels, biscuits and dominoes. We talked a bit about the characteristics of butt joints, mitres, dados and half laps and had a longer discussion on the particulars of the ever popular mortise and tenon joint. Today we're going to cover box and finger joints and the dovetail. So let's get started with the box joint. Firstly, what's the difference between a box joint and a, a finger joint? <laughs> well, Roger. my theory, I, I, think this is, I think it's a simple matter of the finger joint is uh, the, 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 the joints are smaller than the thickness of the material. In other words, a box joint, they appear square and a finger joint, there's just more of them. They're just, you know, it's a tighter configuration. I, I think that's what it is. I'm not sure. I, never, I don't know if you can even look it up, the, the difference, but okay. that's been my recollection of it. Same, same with you, Mickey? Yeah. I, I, that would be my recollection. Mm. So what about the construction of a, let's call it a box joint? I, it's, it's from been my experience, I've done, a few, I've done them a few times. It's a very difficult joint to, to, to pull off you know, well because there's a lot of them and the alignment is crucial you know, to, get them to, to, to get the spacing to occur mm -hmm. at that kind of interval precisely is a very, very challenging mm -hmm. uh, uh, way to do it. I think you know, when they're done commercially, they're done on a, you'll have a gang of cutters that'll cut them all at the same time and those, the machine is set up perfectly to, to do that every time. But you know, to a, a small shop like, like ourselves or you know, any, anybody endeavoring, you'd probably have to cut them one at a time and shift the part you know, that precise distance each time yeah. you cut them. And it's a supremely challenging operation to do, so. Yeah, for, for the amateur woodworker, you, you can buy off the shelf a, a, um, a number of different jigs mm -hmm. yes. for making these. Yeah. yeah, and they're indexed so that you, know, you, you move it exactly right. But like Ron was saying in the last show, um, if you haven't set yourself up, your jig up perfectly, you start getting successive error as you move down and the whole thing can go south real quickly. So, but yeah, little joints with little indexes where you sort of walk yourself down the board mm -hmm. is generally how it's done. It's one of those things, you know, any small error is multiplied compounded times yeah. how many joints there are. So yeah. you start off with a very slight error and by the time you get to the end, it's become a, mm -hmm. a big error, so. <laughs> so you're frightening me already then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to, in some Practice. ways you have to think like you're doing production work. You're, you're not thinking in terms of, oh, I'm just gonna do this one joint because you're repeating the same process over and over again. So it requires um, being extremely accurate with one particular function, and then you just repeat that function, you know, as, as many times as you, the width of your piece, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the same thing with, with dovetails. Accuracy is what you are definitely um, striving for, mm -hmm. so that you don't have the frustration of having to work on something and then <laughs> throw it out because it didn't quite fit. Mm -hmm. you know? A lot of the joinery um, techniques that we've been talking about the ones that we talked about in part one, and now we're talking about um, the box joint and the finger joint, we've, we've mentioned use of the, the router. Mm -hmm. 
We haven't yet mentioned the use of, um, say, the table saw, um, or we haven't mentioned a lot about um, uh, hand saws um, and, and hand tools. Uh, do you ever use um, table saw or, or other? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do you Absolutely. have a preference? It depends, depends on the joint. Yeah, <laughs> very much depends okay. on the joint. Um, I mean, they they have uh, jigs that you can set up with a router table to do a box or a finger joint. Mm -hmm. Likewise, you can use a, a a similar but a different kind of jig where you're working off of a, a table saw. Exactly. In both cases, you're sort of passing the wood over the cutter, and you have to very accurately sort of. Uh, position it and then hop it over a, a, an accurate spacing and then just repeat that spacing. So, and also, um, I I find that a table saw will, if you're just doing a simple straight cut like that, we usually cut a little cleaner because it's it's just going perpendicular to the piece that you're cutting, and you can control the tear out by obviously backing it up with something, and whereas on a router table. It's spinning and it l sometimes can make something hop a little bit. So it's it's just my preference for that. Okay. <clears throat> Let's move on to the to the dovetail. I think every amateur woodworker out there would love to uh, to make dovetails um, to the same standard that uh, that you professional guys um, make them. And everybody looks at dovetails and thinks, oh, that's a lovely joint. How can I how can I make that? Talk to us a bit about uh, the dovetail joint. Yeah, the dovetail is. There's no doubt about it. It's the hallmark of craftsmanship. It's mm -hmm. the, you know, it's the logo that fine woodworker woodworking incorporates into their masthead, and it it, it truly is. It's it's uh, if you want to say fine woodworking, it's said best with the dovetail. So it, it's almost every everybody who embarks in this uh, uh, quest of craftsmanship. It's almost mandatory. You have to you have to be able to produce a dovetail joint at a certain point, and uh, you know I, I, I find that when I do uh, if I do a piece of uh, furniture out there that it's going to be on display, people open the drawers and I know what they're looking for. They want to see a dovetail mm -hmm. joint, and if you don't have it there, mm -hmm. they're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like I said, it's almost mandatory. Uh, so it's and there's so many different ways to do them. So it's kind of up to each individual to find their own way and what kind they want to do. Okay. So w which ways would would you three would you three use, Mickey? Uh, I've actually done it by hand and I've done it with machines. And part of that is speed. Um, you know, if you if you've got yourself set up, in fact. Our esteemed Mr. Heitzman has written an article recently about that using jigs and bandsaws to, to sort of automate dovetailing to some extent, and mm -hmm. I've, I've used that sort of method. And you know, I've cut them by hand, and it's one of those things where you got to do a few to remember how to do it. You know, mm -hmm. if you have if you don't do them every day or every week, you know, I find that you got to do a few. And screw them up and remember. Oh yeah, you know, get that muscle memory back. And it's not an easy thing. I mean, I, you know, you can see, you can find videos online, and you know, Frank Klaus or one of those guys, and it's done. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that looks great, but you've been doing it for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's one of those things where, like Roger says, it's it's expected on certain pieces, and mm -hmm. so you've just got to put in the time and okay. and do it. So what's this article you've just written? Well, I was, uh, yeah, I, when you said that, I thought, no, I haven't. I uh, would like to, <laughs> but uh, I have an article in me, but I haven't, uh, I haven't written an article on. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you should. Sorry. So, so what's going to yeah. be in the article? Well, you know, I, uh, I developed a system. You know, in fact, one of my first pieces long, long ago was that very thing that I was talking about. I, was, I had stars in my eyes, and I wanted to be a fine woodworker. And, so I had to do, I had to make dovetails. So I made, I designed this piece and I cut all, I, there, there was four drawers in it and I, I cut all of the dovetails by hand. They were gonna be through dovetails and I chose impossibly difficult materials, zebra wood and maple, <laughs> and hand cut them all. And as I went through that, it was, a, it was a long slog. There was a lot of cutting, a lot of hand cutting, a lot of chiseling. And as I went through that, I kept, Telling myself or saying to myself that it's got to be a better way. I mean, it just—it like, was so difficult and so 
troubling and I just saw the inherent problems with each technique that I was using and uh, so over the years I've sort of addressed those issues that I found and, and, and found what I thought were better ways so what I've settled upon now that I generally use is a combination of bandsaw, table saw and router and hand work but all, you know, all four of those things in one to produce one set of dovetails but it turned out to be pretty quick and extremely accurate yeah. and I can get a very nice fine hand cut looking uh, mm -hmm. You know, but it is pretty much hand cut. I'm just using hand tool or using power tools to, you know, remove bulk material and, and do it more accurately, more precisely than you can with the, mm -hmm. you know, trying to guide a hand saw through difficult wood. It's, uh, and I just also learned from that experience that I wasn't really in love with hand work that much. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, there's something to be said for it, but. Right. Um, a lot okay. to be said for. We'll, we'll look forward to the article. Yeah, well, when I get around to <laughs> that, <laughs> let us know what it's yeah. yeah. um, What about you, Ron? How, how would you approach a, well, a project using dovetails? I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I very rarely do these by hand. I mean, it's, it's, there's, um, it's, it's always a function of, uh, when you're a professional, there's always a function of you know, what's the budget. Well, you know, is your client going to really uh, be sufficiently um, enamored of this look that you're going to do this and spend that much more time on it? So I'm always trying to figure out, okay, how do I get the look that I want, but at the same time, do it quick? And, and at the same time, I'm not sacrificing any in terms of the integrity of the piece or anything like that. So yeah, I mean, uh, I think we all have our own little sort of techniques, and mine is primarily with the router and some hand work. Okay. <clears throat> so how many variations are there on the um, on the dovetail theme? There, there are lots of different oh, yeah. dovetails, yeah? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. What, what are they? Yeah, you've, got, you've got your through dovetail, which is a right. perfect example right here. Yeah. And you've got your half blind, which this is a classic example of, where you can only see them from one side. They're not visible from the front. So this would be a perfect so application of a drawer front that, round. that you right. didn't want to. Yeah, you didn't want to see the uh, the dovetails. Okay. Uh, and you've got a, a completely blind where you would have them fit together with a miter joint, so you don't see the dovetail from either side or front. I never did understand the point of that, but uh, yeah. just because of the labor involved yeah. to do it for. You're not and even also, going to see it. if you're going to make go through the energy to do this type of joint, mm -hmm. you want to see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it becomes it's a it's a decorative joint, so you might as well go ahead and show it off. I mean, it, it, there are times in which if this is the front where you don't want to interrupt the grain of the wood, and then other times where if this is the front, uh, this this detail of seeing the end grain here becomes you know, a feature of the design of the piece. So do you want that to interrupt the grain or do you want the, the, the look of the, the end grain there of the dovetail to be a feature? Depends on the piece, you know. And so a lot of times you, you sort of vary the, the, uh, the joint in order to accomplish the look that you're after. Mm -hmm. Both of these are incredibly strong. I mean, that's, that's also the main thing about the dovetail is it's a very strong mechanical joint. Mm -hmm. And that by the time you put this together with modern glues, it's pretty bulletproof, mm -hmm. you know. When we've been talking about different uh, joinery techniques, different joints, you've, you've said, well, it depends on the project. It really depends on, on what, you, what you want to achieve. Um, if we took a, a for instance, um, say a, a drawer, um, I know when I've looked at, uh, at different drawers in different cabinets or tables or whatever, they're constructed very differently. They can be constructed very differently. Um, how would you, what sort of joinery would you use in constructing a drawer? And talk, a, and talk us through some of the some of the some of the, some of the variables. I, I, I've just I'm almost laughing because I, I've been through the whole gamut. You know, we probably all have, but I, I, dovetail joints on a drawer aren't essential, especially if you're using nice. You know, if you're using mechanical drawer glides, the drawers are always going to move in and out nicely, and you know, there's just it's it's not needed for the strength. And on my own, one of my own bathroom vanities at home, I literally nailed 
pin nailed the drawers together because I was in a hurry and I wanted to get it done. And 15 years later, the drawers are just fine. There's no, you know, they're holding together nicely. It's yep. still tight and all of that. I mean, it was almost, it's almost embarrassing because, <laughs> you know, I, but I, it was the choice I yeah. made. I just did not have the time and patience to sit down and put together a nice drawer. Mm. But, you know, you get a nice, uh, 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 dowel joint or you know you screw the drawers together cap the screws those are all quick ways to do it mm -hmm. and you get a nice solid drawer, drawer box but yeah. uh, again you know it's it's people have equated dovetails and drawers and that's what uh, yeah. if I'm producing a piece professionally it's mm -hmm. a whole different animal and I'm Okay, yeah. so it's, it's customer driven. Yeah it, it, well it is in to some, some extent, ways and yeah. it's uh, <coughs> yeah it, it does it makes a statement yeah. it mm -hmm. really does. Mm -hmm. And you know, for someone who who isn't necessarily making a portfolio piece, you know, Roger hit on it. You there are any number of ways you can make a functional drawer that works, sure. yeah. as long as you've got the side and the front oriented correctly, so that when you pull it, it doesn't pull the front away. You can have nails through there. You can have dowels. You can have dominoes. You can have biscuits. You know, any sort of thing that'll keep those from slipping. Those are all perfectly functional joints. Um, it just depends on how much time and effort you want to put into that drawer and. Again, the application, is it a bathroom vanity that you're knocking together that you know, may or may not be around 15 years later, <laughs> even though yours is? Or is it something you know, you're gonna sell to a client that's gonna be passed down, so. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it was driven also by you know older uh, in older furniture you know where they weren't using mechanical slides they weren't even available right. and then you get into sticking drawers and things like that where you're tugging pretty mm -hmm. hard to get a drawer open well then you need a better joinery to hold that drawer box together yeah. but like I say with the advent of modern uh, you know ball bearing guides and, and the like of that uh, it's, it's much lesser of an issue yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so. And the dovetail becomes more and more of a um, decorative thing, you know. But it's also a good indication of quality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it is a, a more laborious type of uh, joint to produce. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to me, it's always an indication of well, if you're gonna, if you want to show your best stuff, then that's that's how you go about doing it, mm -hmm. right? But not every job, like you say, is not <laughs> warrants yeah. that, you know. Mm. So how much of your time is spent educating a client or a customer when they've commissioned a piece of furniture from you? How much input do they have um, on details such as joinery or is it really the overall concept that they're more interested in hmm. and they'll leave the, uh, the detail of the joinery up to yourselves? Uh, for me, most of that sort of joinery decision-making is mine. The client usually isn't that specifically interested. I mean, my clients are more interested in the overall look of the piece, and right. so I drive, you know, what I think is their taste sort of drives how much ornamentation comes on it, you know, how fancy the drawers are, the, the joinery, and through joints and things like that, you know, mm -hmm. that'll sort of be driven. And then they have input on whether they like it or not. And, you know, so mm -hmm. that's too much. Drop, you know, pull it back or whatever. But uh, usually, most of the joinery decisions are mine, and, and most of my clients don't don't you know get into it that specifically. Yeah, I concur. the the uh, The early days, I would sort of have to explain to clients what the difference yeah. was, and so why it would cost more to do this versus that. And as you sort of get uh, more experience and at the same time uh, just more of a reputation, I suppose, then, then you don't need to, to go through all of that education as much. They fortunately will say, gosh, we like your work. We love the quality. We love the design features. Uh, you know, here's what we need and the basic parameters. And then you just sort of, yeah. you know, take it from there. And mm -hmm. they, they leave most of those joiner decisions up to you. Okay. There's very few clients that are that knowledgeable about a lot of this stuff. So many of them are, but they, mm -hmm. they'll they certainly defer to you mm -hmm. right. as to mm -hmm. how best to go about doing it. 
I mean, usually that kind of knowledge for on the client's uh, part comes from them being a woodworker. You know, most, <laughs> yeah. most people or interested in woodworking. Yeah, they're not, if they're not really interested in the the nuts and bolts of the, the yeah. craft themselves, they, they they know very little about it. You know, a lot of times <laughs> I have to spend more of my time educating a client about veneer versus solid wood. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, those kind of topics yeah. rather than joinery. Mm -hmm. you know? Or is this really walnut? You know? yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised so. how many people and, that don't even know what wood it is. Yeah. yeah. And there's also an aspect of of not necessarily educating, but just sort of like, I mean, I guess educating would be the word, but, but bringing the client into the process, um, like on, on several pieces, I've, I, I started a blog a couple years ago, and like, if it's a complicated piece that's doing something that's really interesting, I, I will put the entire like how-to as it goes along, and the client can pull that up and see what kind of work is going into it. And that sort of goes into justifying the cost that it, you know, that it requires to make a piece, you know, especially pieces that are complicated to make but simple to look at, you know, that have a, a very clean design where you don't see all the joinery that goes into it or all the fancy curved work of the veneering and everything. That sort of education sort of becomes part and parcel of how you put the whole package together. Mm -hmm you know, and, and kind of educate them as you go along and mm -hmm. they can go to the blog or the website or whatever and say, oh yeah, you know, there's 87 steps in this table and gosh, I had no idea, that kind of thing. Okay, and as far as the, the decorative aspect of a, of a joint is concerned, I, I guess that is also um, influenced by the, the, the style of the furniture that you're making. So I know, Ron, you, you make um, a lot of Asian influenced mm -hmm. furniture if you're creating a traditional piece or a more contemporary piece. That in itself then will dictate, I'm assuming, the type of join perhaps that you'll you'll use in it. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, and and I think uh, the arts and crafts movement was also influenced sort of back and forth mm -hmm. between that. And so you would you would show your joinery and you'd and you would have the designs fairly simple, but you know, showing the joinery was um, a a mark of craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. You know. And so that has always been something that has appealed to me, mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, I mean, I, there, there are people that make furniture that really couldn't be bothered with joiner, but, f you know, for me, the joinery is where it's at and, and why I do it. Well, I think we've covered pretty much what I wanted to cover with, with uh, joinery, but you just touched upon something, Roger, and I think we have time to, to talk a bit about this. This is something that is, that is of interest to me because I've heard this on, uh, from a number of people on a number of occasions. Um, people question whether a veneer mm. <laughs> is an appropriate um, technique to use and sometimes look upon that as a, um, a cheaper way of constructing something. Uh, they, 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 they question the value of something if, if it's veneered. How do you address that with, with it's a... Absolutely, because it's gotten such a bad reputation. I mean, yeah. you know, people just equate, when they hear veneer, they think cheap, plywood, they, you know, uh, it just has gotten a bad reputation. But, you know, and so what I have to say, I, I do a lot of veneering. I do a mm. lot of veneer work in my, in my work. And, it, you know, if done properly, it's far better in a lot of applications than solid wood because of the inherent stability that mm -hmm. it gives a part. I mean, wood is, solid wood is constantly moving and, uh, you know, seasonal changes and all that. That's a big topic of uh, joinery is that you have to allow for wood to expand and contract and move because it's, it's still alive in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. So veneering, using a veneer over a, you know, a solid core of something, you give a much, much more stable panel. Mm -hmm. And also you have a much greater uh, variety of woods available. In, in veneer also. You get different patterns and different, you know, that you just can't, aren't available in solid stock. So, mm -hmm. but I do have to then therefore spend my time educating a client why it's okay mm -hmm. to use veneer mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. even better. So you said you'd veneer over a solid core. What, what, what core wood would, would you use if you're veneering, Mickey? Uh, most cores are laminated like apple ply here, mm -hmm. uh, or some people use MDF, uh, mm -hmm. depending on the application, because it's really flat and really stable. Um, uh, you can veneer over solid wood, but then you haven't really helped yourself as far as wood movement goes. I mean, you're, you're then 
getting a look, but you're not really getting the functional benefit of veneering, mm -hmm. would you say? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think most people don't even understand the, the principle behind plywood and why it's so stable. And that's basically you're taking, you know, you, the, right. the plywood is basically stacks of veneer where they're just taking each layer and they're laying them cross band to each mm -hmm. other as they yep. stack it. So it cancels out, you know, they interlock and they cancel out the expansion and contraction because they're both working, mm -hmm. you know, right. against and for each other. So dimensionally that's the, stable. That's the, the, dimensional, the dimensional stability of plywood. And uh, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with plywood. It's just that it's not solid wood. So it just sort of, uh, I think it's kind of a marketing uh, uh, thing that happened over the years that, you know, oh, everything's being made cheaper and cheaper these days and they're starting to use plywood instead of solid wood. And mm -hmm. you know, well, that's not necessarily a bad thing, mm -hmm. really. It's well, not. and plywood got a bad rap because in the beginning, plywood was really good and then it got really cheap. And you can get really bad plywood that's made of thick, lousy cores that warps. And you know, cheap plywood is as bad as cheap anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so plywood got a bad rap for a while. And if you buy you know, high quality veneer core stable plywood, then you're good to go. Um, and a lot of like what Roger said, um, part of the bad rap is that, you know, Cheap stuff is now using chipboard and stuff that will, you know, if it gets wet, it will expand and blow apart. And when people hear veneer, that's what they think of. Um, right. And so that's really not the case. And that's where the education comes in that we have to say, no, we're not using chipboard. It's not, you know, cheapy stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's sometimes just as expensive, if not more, than solid wood. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more stable and it's got its, its own benefits. And, mm -hmm. You know, it. it it suffers from bad publicity. Yeah, I mean, in fact, case in point, I mean, doing veneer work, I find, is more labor intensive yeah. than doing solid work, uh, solid wood work. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very uh, time consuming, labor intensive <laughs> work that uh, requires special tools and skills. And yeah, yeah it's uh, not easy to do. So mm -hmm. it's not cheap at all, yeah. not at least, at least <laughs> not when we do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So as a, as a basic amateur myself, I'm sitting here thinking, do you veneer and then join something together? Or do you join things together and then veneer? Well, you know, it's, it's you're, you're creating a panel generally yeah. with veneer. And, and so uh, how that panel is joined is it's not, you know, join, most of the stuff we've been talking about previously in our previous discussions about joinery is solid using solid wood. Mm. We're not talking about joining plywood, which is you can kind of look at what we're talking about is we're creating our own plywood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So. Um, OK, well, thank you for discussing that, that bit on veneering. Like I say, it didn't really fit in with the overall theme of joinery, but uh, it was, I, I, I was really interested myself. And it was trip. Inquiring yeah. minds one yeah. more. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks once again. And that concludes today's program and our two-part coverage of joinery methods and techniques. We hope you found it interesting and instructive and that it'll prove to be useful in your future woodworking projects. Thank you, Roger, Ron, and Mickey. Our producer, Keith Gudger, and myself would like to thank all of the staff and volunteers at Santa Cruz Community TV. And in particular, Annie Newman, Suzanne Dyer, Jazelle, and Karen Scott for their work on today's program. Thank you for watching, and please join us again for the next episode of Woodworks Roundtable. Goodbye. <laughs>